Not everybody's a Lakers fan here? No. Clippers? Uh -oh. Wow, that's sad. Okay, well, all right, we can pray for you. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's a real honor to be here. I've been a big fan of Hope for a long time, and I know some of your faculty here, and uh, just uh, I'm really thrilled to be here. And I didn't grow up in California. I grew up in Kansas, um, and I, then I worked in uh, Kentucky for about nine years, and then I moved out to California uh, about 15 years ago. But I've always been a Lakers fan, yeah. and so I feel like it was just God, you know, rewarding me, uh, right. so bringing me out here to be close. So, man... Uh, <laughs> So if you're not, I'm praying for your soul, and I don't know if you'll get into heaven. But anyway, uh, it really is, uh, really is a joy to be here. And when I moved out here uh, to California, our, our church was brand new, and our church had been planted uh, by a, a great individual named Kyle Eidelman, who planted this church in Valencia, and they they started in a movie theater. And when I, Kyle was here for about two years, and then he left, got called him elsewhere, and then got called me out here uh, to kind of take it over from there. We're still meeting in a movie theater, and over the last, you know, 15 years, it's been movie theater into high school and then into a, a permanent building and then multi-site. So it's been a wild ride. But when I first got here, um, you know, I was just kind of new to the whole California thing. I mean, if you grow up in the Midwest... You kind of have your ideas of what California is like, but you've never really lived here. And so moving here was exciting for my wife and I. And our, we had one child at the time, and, and she was about nine months old. And so we were excited to get to know our community, to build friendships and relationships with everybody, and, and invite them to the church. And the church was still relatively new and everything. And so we moved into this area that had a little community pool right in the middle of all the homes. And we thought this will be perfect because we'll get to know everybody really well. And then I can invite them to church. Sounds like a great idea. So, so uh, we were getting ready for, you know, we were kind of moving in and everything and kind of thinking about this Saturday we're going to go hang out at the pool. And I realized I didn't have, uh, I didn't have a, a, any swimming trunks. You know, I know no swimsuit. Okay, you, you know, in Kentucky, we don't have pools, just ponds and lakes. And so I thought, well, I got to go, uh, you know, get, get a, some, uh, you know, some kind of a swimming suit somewhere. And, you know, if you're from California, if you go to the mall looking for a swimsuit in June, which is when we moved here, there's nothing left. And so I scoured the mall looking for a suit, and I found one. And it was the last one they had, and it was bright orange. Like, working on the highway orange, right? But I thought, what am I going to do? It's the only one I, they got. So I buy this suit. And then Saturday rolls around, and we get, you know, ready to go to the pool, and I got the orange suit on, and my nine-month-old daughter's got her little suit on, got a little inner tube for her, you know, and we're all excited, and we take the stroller down, we go out to the, to the community pool. Neighbors start coming out of their houses and kind of populate the pool, and I get in the water with my daughter, and we're kind of splashing around. I hand her over to my wife, and I get out, and I think this is a great chance to go meet some people, maybe invite them to church. And so I walk around, you know, shaking hands, talking to people and all that. Then I get back in the water, and I'm sitting there on the step next to my wife and, and daughter. My wife looks at me, and she goes, Rusty, what is all over your suit? I said, what are you talking about? And I look down, and apparently this suit that I bought uh, was one of those that images appear on it when it gets wet. <laughs> and I wish I could tell you it was crosses and you know, fish and that kind of thing, but, but it wasn't. It was topless women. Oh, that's right. I've been walking around meeting people. How you doing? Good to see you. New pastor in town. Yep, that's right. Come on out to our church, real life church, clothing optional. You know, make yourself known. It was a man. It was a stunning moment. Okay, so I I slipped out of the pool and wrapped up in the towel, you know, and hey, we'll see you never, and kind of just you know went away to home. It was a stunning moment. I didn't see that. I didn't see that coming at all, you know. Now, so here's here's what I want to talk to you about today. Hopefully, you've never had that experience, but you certainly have worn something that you wish you hadn't. Known. And sometimes that's you know a shirt. Sometimes that's a pair of pants. Sometimes that's a jacket. Whatever it is. But for many of us, it's something a little bit deeper than that. And something a little bit more metaphoric than that, and that is this idea of envy. Most of us, our entire lives, will struggle with the big green monster of envy and jealousy, and we'll wear that into every aspect of our lives. Now, I don't know when you notice that you might struggle with envy, but I know when it was for me. I was a sixth grader, and it was Christmas break, and for Christmas, I opened up a package from my folks, and inside of it was a, a green sweater. 
Now, normally kids don't like clothes, but I was sixth grade, so I was into the, you know, the age where I was interested in girls and all that, and I liked, cared what I looked like. And this green sweater was awesome because it was bright green, and it had a little alligator on it. That's an eyes out, everybody. And this is the 80s, so green, I put a pink shirt under it, and I am totally awesome, all right? So I was really thrilled about this green sweater, and so I could not wait to go back to school and show off this great green sweater to everybody. And I just knew this would be a babe magnet, all right? The girls would come running from all over the place. And I roll into school in this green sweater, and everything was great until Greg Williams, I still remember his name. The therapist drew it out of me. Greg Williams comes walking down the hallway, and he's got on a new sweater as well, but his is not an Izod, it's a polo. Oh, and polo outranks the Izod. That's right. Everybody turned and looked at Greg. Oh, Greg, I love your sweater. Look at your sweater, Greg. Greg Williams, you know, and I'm still bitter at him. But, you know, in that moment, I thought, I loved my sweater until I saw his sweater. Let me give you a quote from Pastor Craig Rochelle. He says, the fastest way to kill something special is to compare it to something else. Now think about how true that is in your life and in my life. I mean, for maybe your situation is, as you come back from Christmas break and you've got a new car and it's a Prius, you feel really good about that because you're saving the environment. <laughs> so your roommate rolls up in a Tesla. And you're like, oh, it's not so good anymore, right? I mean, think about when you, you know, you're on social media, you, you throw out a tweet that would make Tozer cry. It was so beautiful, right? And then so nobody likes it at all, you know? Think about, you know, you're, you're in the dorm, you know, by yourself, and then you look on Instagram and all your friends are out at a concert. You think, why didn't I get invited? Everything was great. So you compare it to something else. Maybe that's a relationship, maybe that's a friendship, maybe that's a ministry that you're involved in, and everything is fine until you compare it to something else. And the quickest way to kill something special is to compare it to something else. You see, here's the reality for you and me when it comes to this comparison game. We either feel superior or we feel inferior, and neither one glorifies God. Yeah. For some of us, we feel superior. We start looking around at other people and we think, oh, well, it's too bad for you. I guess I'm just more blessed than you are. That's just because I live a better life. It's just because God doesn't love me more, but he certainly has taken care of me better. And you don't say those things, but you kind of think those things because you're comparing yourself to somebody else and feeling superior. But for many of us, we don't go that route, we go the other route. And suddenly, by comparing ourselves to somebody else, we feel inferior. Everything was great until we started looking at somebody else's. Everything felt fine until we started looking at somebody else's situation. Yep. And I wish I could tell you that this ended for me in sixth grade, with, sixth grade with Greg Williams, but it didn't. It moved on into high school, into college, into my adult life, and it will be something that every single one of us struggles with because all of us are tempted to compare ourselves to other people. You know, when you read through the scriptures, you read about the most interesting of characters. This is one of the reasons I believe the Bible, because if you're making up a religion, you don't make people look as ridiculous as these people look in the Bible. The only one that gets it right is Jesus. Everybody else is just stumbling around making fools of themselves, which is why I feel so good about my situation, looking at them thinking, I guess if they can make it, I can too. And a couple of these guys, Peter and John, are two of Jesus' closest friends and most devout followers, but when you take a deeper look into their you know, kind of relationship with each other, I'm not so sure they liked each other. And here's why. Because they were constantly comparing themselves to one another. You see these things come up in their conversation, like, oh, I got to sit next to Jesus, or it's almost like they're calling shotgun every time they get near Jesus. I'm gonna sit next to Jesus, I'm gonna sit next to you. Jesus, who's gonna be the greatest in your kingdom? Who's gonna sit on the right? Who's gonna sit on the left? And this kind of comparison keeps going on and on. Even so, when you read John's biography about Jesus, he writes into the biography who he is in the relationship. And he says, oh, by the way, I'm the one Jesus loved. Mm -hmm. 
Isn't that great? You know anybody that talks in the third person? Aren't they annoying? God bless them. But you know, they're annoying. They are. And I mean, it's a little bit like when you read the Old Testament, which Moses wrote a part of, and he wrote, Moses was the most humble person around. I mean, that's funny. I don't care who you are, right? And we just, we, we, we look at those names and we think you guys are perfect, but they're not. And they struggled with the comparison game. And I want you to think about that as we read this passage we're going to look at today and what Jesus said to them in regards to this issue of envy. And for many of us, you walk in here today with a million things on your mind of what you've got to do, but the underlying tone is how you keep up with everybody else. And the comparison game is robbing your soul of life. Here's what we read about in John's biography about Jesus. Here's the setting. Jesus has been crucified. Jesus has come back from the dead, but nobody knows it yet. And it's Easter Sunday morning. And the women go out to prepare the body for burial. It's already buried, but they got to do all the anointing of spices and oil. It's kind of their embalming process. Here's what John tells us. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, who's that? The one Jesus loved. And said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. And here we go. John's writing this down. He's writing this down a few years after all this happened. And he's letting us know all the things that happened. And he gets to the point where Jesus has come back from the dead. And he just wants us to know who's present. And there's Peter. And there's Mary. And oh, by the way, there's the one Jesus loved. <laughs> who's him? Look how he continues. This is so great. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. This is such an odd fact to include here. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. How much of a guy is this, right? Jesus rose from the dead, but I'm faster than Peter. I want everybody to know that, right? And finally, this is great. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, he also went inside. Once again, yeah, I got there first. Now, I didn't go in first. Peter ran on in. That's just the way he is. But then I finally went in. Now, now fast forward a little bit. They've seen Jesus. They've been around Jesus. And you fast forward a few days, and now they're out on the boat. Because Peter is still wrestling with this whole thing of, man, the last time Jesus heard me talk before he was crucified, I denied him three times. And now they're all back to the fishing business. And they're back out there in this boat. And look what happens then. Jesus shows up and he's on the shore and he says something to them that is so characteristic of Jesus. They just know it's him because he says, you might try throwing the net on the other side of the boat. And they do and they catch all these fish. Look what happens. Then the disciple, which one? John's writing this. So it's the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, I think that's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he'd taken it off and he jumped into the water. And I don't know if John's just letting us know how undignified Peter is because he's fishing naked and now he's swimming in his clothes. And, you know, I don't know if that's his point, but he lets us know that Peter goes swimming in to see Jesus. Now what happens next is what makes this story so powerful. Because Jesus sits around and has breakfast with these guys. And then he looks at Peter and he says, let's go for a walk. And while they're walking, Jesus looks at Peter and he says, hey, I just gotta know, you love me? Are you still with me? Because a few years ago, I said, I'm building my church on you. Are you still with me? And he goes, you know I love you. No idea. And Jesus asks him this three times. See the irony there? Three denials, three questions. And each time Jesus looks at Peter, he says, then here's what I want you to do. I want you to feed my sheep. What does that mean? Take care of the church. I'm handing you the keys. Now notice what's going on in the background. John writes this. Peter turned around and he saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. 
I mean, Jesus and Peter are having this, like, literally, a come-to-Jesus meeting, walking down the, the shore, and there's John behind him, lurking around, you know, just trying to figure out what's being said, what's happening. And look what Peter says. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? In other words, I get to feed your sheep. What's he going to do? Is he going to be higher than me? Is he going to be lower than me? Is he going to reign over me, or do I get to lord over him? And what Jesus says next has the power to break envy in your life and in mine. Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Peter, if I want him to have a higher job than yours, what is that to you? If I want him to be less than you, what is that to you? If I want him to never die, what is that to you? You must follow me. And you know, I told you that I struggled with envy in sixth grade. But it didn't really stop. Because I found that every season of my life, I found somebody new to compare myself to. And most recently, it happened when I moved out here to California and took over a church that was started by somebody else. This amazing, charismatic teacher, incredible author, fantastic guy who I would consider a friend named Kyle. And I was fine with Kyle until I moved out here because Kyle left a lot of followers and fans behind. And it wasn't long into my 10 years being a pastor that people would come up to me and go, hey, uh, where's Kyle? You ever talk to Kyle? How's Kyle doing? Kyle ever coming back to speak? We miss Kyle. Wow. And that was my wife. You know, I'm kidding. But I found all these fans that would come out of the woodwork and talk about, boy, Kyle did this, Kyle did that. Are you keeping up with Kyle? Is Kyle ever coming out to speak? No, Kyle's never coming out to speak, so shut up, all right? Kyle left you. I'm here. You're stuck with me. Things you think but don't say, right? But it just kept going and going and going. And every time Kyle would write a book, somebody would bring it to me. Hey, you read Kyle's new book? Yeah, I saw that. You know, on and on they go. And Kyle and Kyle. It just it really got into my soul. And I don't have a problem with Kyle. I like Kyle. I just didn't like how much other people liked him. And so deep into this thing that I was wrestling with in my life, my wife and I went away to a week-long pastor's retreat place where you meet with a counselor during the day, you know, when you walk through the mountains in the evening, and it's just a great kind of five days to get your, your head on straight. And I find myself there wrestling with this whole Kyle issue, talking with this counselor about it, right? And every night, all the people who were there would get together for dinner, and we just have dinner, and kind of get to know each other. One night I'm sitting there at dinner with this other uh, a pastor and his wife, and they're sitting across the table from us, and he's got a church in Minnesota, and we're talking about that, and he says, now, where's your church? I said, Valencia, California. He goes, isn't that where Kyle Idol's church is? I thought, are you kidding me? I mean, I can't get away from this guy, right? <laughs> and it just kept working inside of my heart so much, and so much so that one day as I was wrestling with my struggle with him, I just felt like God said to me, what is that to you? What is it to you if people were blessed by Kyle's ministry? What is it to you if his church is bigger than yours? What is it to you if I use him in a different way than I'm going to use you? You must follow which makes me think about this passage in Hebrews where we, we kind of wrestle with this whole idea of who are we running next to? And, and look what it says here. This is just a powerful phrase here. The writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything 
that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, the beautiful picture it paints for us right here is that we are in a race, but we are not competing against each other. We are simply running to Jesus. Yeah. And when you and I start looking around at the people around us, when we start reading the social media stats that pastors like to throw out there, when we start reading the press clippings from other people, when we start looking at how good somebody else has it instead of us, then suddenly we stop running towards Jesus. Wow. And Jesus seems to say, would you just stay in your lane? What is it to you if I bless them differently than I bless you? What is it to you if you faithfully serve a small group of 10 while they lead a church of 10,000? What is it to you if they get married and you don't? What is it to you if they have a bunch of kids and you don't? What is it to you if they publish books and you don't? You must follow me. Stay in your Lane. So I decided I'm going to stay in my lane with this whole thing. And I discovered a few things that helped me in the process. One, every now and then, we just got to take a social media fast. Mm. You know what I mean? Because we are inundated with images all day long about how good everybody else's life is, right? And we're looking at their highlight reel and we're looking at our blooper reel. And we're thinking about how great they are and how awful and miserable we are. And every now and then, take a few days off. You'll freak out for a few hours. Let me just tell you, your thumbs will twitch. You don't know what to do, but it's, it's going to be okay. Another great thing that might help you is to just keep a, you know, a gratitude journal. Because you and I are really good at counting other people's blessings, but we're not real good at counting our own. And just writing down what God has done in our lives rather than all the things we see in somebody else's life. And something that really helped me was just to celebrate other people's successes that used to bother me. Yeah. And so here's what I did. When Kyle would put out a book, I'd go buy it. I'd read it. I'd send him an email and tell him how great it was. Kyle, this, this book is your best yet. I hope you sell dozens. Man, I hope it goes really good for you. That was a joke. Okay. <laughs> but I would wrestle with this by celebrating that person. And you know what? Kyle's not the only one I had to do this with. And I think I'll wrestle with this until I reach Jesus. But until then, I'm going to stay in my lane. Maybe that means for you, instead of looking around at what everybody else has, you're going to stay in your lane. Instead of looking around at how everybody else is blessed, you're going to stay in your lane. Instead of looking at how everybody else has opportunities you don't, you're going to stay in your lane. Because what is it to you if God chooses to use them differently than he uses you? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you're a God of love and of grace and of mercy. And you continue to give us second chances when we make ridiculous mistakes of turning our head to the right or the left and staring at other people's lives and comparing ourselves and even getting mad at you for the way that you bless somebody else instead of us. God, for so many of us, we walked in here clinging to uh, opinions of people or desiring approval from people. And God, we just want to be people that learn how to let envy go. Instead of constantly observing what other people are getting or not or doing or not, we just want to focus in on what you want us to do and how you want us to do it. God, I pray for every student in this room, all of those that are represented here at Hope, and I pray your deepest and richest blessing on their life of being able to see 
how you're going to use them. And being able to sense that impact that their life has had. So God, would you just continue to speak to our hearts right now about what it is you want us to let go of. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.